Jesus and me. But uh, I, I, he took me, John took me to a, a conference in Texas. And uh, I got to hear this man speak. We were going to have him come to Hillcrest and speak to our men, but he had a little heart issue and uh, the doctors wouldn't let him come. But so I had purpose in my heart that, that I wanted our men to be exposed to him. And then after hearing him speak at a conference in Texas, I was more convinced in my heart that I wanted as many men from our church to hear him and to glean from his wisdom and knowledge that the Lord had built into his life over the years. And I had a desire to do that. And so when we talked about having a men's retreat, I asked John to call and say, could John maybe come from Wichita, Oklahoma City? We haven't traveled too far. And... Uh, speak to our men and so he uh, has obliged us by being here and I'm so grateful when I see a man who understands that there's no such thing as biblical retirement and I see him continue to serve the Lord uh, into his twilight years and to not let down his guard and continue to work diligently with the strength and the stamina he's been given and so uh, I pray that you just ask the Lord, God, what nugget, what truth would you have for me at this time? Because I'll promise you, if you open your heart, you'll have a nugget for you. And it may just change your life. Let's welcome John Crawford to come speak to us. John. What? We ought to find you stand over here. They probably want to hear you. That you can use. Can, can you hear me? Uh, I can get that song. What's that, John? You want to record it? Yeah. Use the mic. Use the, the mic. They want you to use the mic. Mike, you got a mic for you, John. Okay. I can get your Bible. Not till I leave that right there. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Get him right back here, and I'll turn this up. But if you get right behind there, that's, well, that will help. You will be up there. Huh? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, would you fellas want to stand up? Some of you hadn't stood up in a while. Do you want to stand up? <laughs> While we're standing, I'm going to pray for it, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that you'll speak to us tonight through your word. Amen. Amen. Stay standing or sit down or whatever you like. <laughs> uh, you've probably heard about these three fellows who were sitting on the porch there in the rest hall. And one of the younger men come by and said, uh, Dylan, I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, am, I, am I communicating all right? Yeah, keep going. Um, yeah. What would you like when you're put away? What would you come, you come by and see the coffin. What would you like uh, people to say? First gentleman said, "Well, I'd like for them to say that I've been a good family man. I raised my family well, and uh, I, I treated my neighbor well." Yeah. And. Uh, Next gentleman said, well, I, I'd like for him to say that I've been a good soldier and served my country and a uh, uh, good patriotic citizen. The third fellow said, I'd like for him to say, and they look over there and they, and they call him, hey, he's moving. <laughs> <laughs> keep moving as long as you can. Uh, now, fellas, I'm going to presume, I'm going to presume that we've all uh, been to the dedicating meeting and we've all gone forward, so we've dedicated our lives. I'm going to presume that we're all really mean business with Jesus Christ. Uh, so that's my presumption of what I'll be saying. Uh, I won't be trying to recruit new new people or new babes in Christ. I'll be trying to help people share with, with, with fellows who are, are, are committed to serving Jesus Christ. 
in a moment or two, I'm going to ask Peter to share, to read the scripture for us. I'd like to review. I, I can't walk around. If I walk around like this, can you hear me? You don't want that recorded, do you? Can you hear me now? Not very well. Air conditioning is too loud. Okay. Can you hear that? So when we start smelling sweaty, you know it's time to Yeah. You can't put the stir on. I am. In 1 Corinthians 13, yeah. Paul says, 15 rather, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and he was buried, rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Then he was seen of the twelve, and he was seen of Peter, and uh, he was seen of about 500 brethren. Most of them are still alive, few have died. Last of all, he was seen of me. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, John's all, he's okay, he, he's a good boy, he just likes to <laughs> but I'm determined to move around tonight because uh, I want to keep a good eye on you. You don't see very well, but I, I can see you. <laughs> the pastor probably explained it to you many times. Uh, the gospel, the three Ps, the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and the presence of sin. And I appreciated when I read Dr. Ian Thomas's book, The Saving Life of Christ. Uh, I, I read it, I try to read it about every three or four years, uh, and I've, I've been doing this for a number of years. You see, the gospel is, is not only Christ dying on the cross for our sins, but the gospel is that Jesus raised again the third day. See, in 15, 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. See, that's pretty plain talk, okay? I'm giving you the gospel. Okay, now it gives it. How that Christ died for our sins, and he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to, to, to the scripture. You see, death, burial, and resurrection. Well, uh, when Jesus died on the cross, he saved us from the penalty of sin. When Jesus rose again, he saved us, or is in the process of saving us, from the power of sin. Romans 5.10 For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, more we being reconciled, we were being saved by his life. We're in the process of being saved. Being saved from what? From the power of sin. You see, we've already been saved from the penalty of sin. No one can take that away. We already have our ticket points for heaven, see. But now then, we're being saved from the power of sin. Galatians 1.4, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And this present evil world. Now this is what we're going to be dealing with, this present evil world. Now then, of course, he will save us from the presence of sin. Romans 1, I'm sorry, uh, 1 Peter 1, 5. Uh, well, uh, 1 Peter 1, 5, quote it for me. We're protected uh, by the power of God through faith. For draw self, me off. Who are protected uh, by the power of God through faith for a salvation. Unto ready to be salvation. Unto salvation. Ready, ready to be revealed in the last time. In the last time, Jesus is coming back. And, uh, and salvage us from the presence of sin. Uh, right now, we're living this life. And, and fellas, most of the New Testament is living this life. Living this life while we're still here. This brief time that we're here. Most, so, so much of the, the, of the New Testament. And we're going to be going into that. And so... Our time is going to be on how to live victoriously all of our life. How to wind up in good shape. Not how to be an old man. 
that's somebody else's job. But how to be victorious in case you are no man. How to be happy. How to do what you really want to do. How to get done what you really want to get done and what Jesus really wants you to do. How to do that. That's what we're going to deal with. Okay, I'm going to ask Peter now to read, uh, read some scriptures there in Genesis. Abraham and Lot would be what we would call today Christian fellows. Lot, Second uh, Peter 3.8, for that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day. Uh, the scripture calls Lot a righteous man. In Genesis 22, talking about Abraham, and he believed in the Lord and he counted to him for righteousness. They were both righteous men. Abraham had raised Lot. Lot's daddy had died in Ur of the Chaldees. And so Abraham had raised him. And so it's in 310, And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plains of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. Now, I hope we can make this a class format at today and tomorrow. So I'm going to ask you some questions now. And or, as, you, as we go along, I'm going to throw it open and you ask questions. What was one of Lot's mistakes as Uncle Abraham I uh, told him to make a decision. I said, I'm mm -hmm. giving you a lead. I, mm -hmm. I say it was a mistake. He looked at what you could see with the eye, what looked pleasing to the eye. He said, what looked pleasing to the eye? Pleasing to the eye. That's right. That's a basic doctrine. 16, 7 in 1 Samuel where Samuel was going to choose a king, you remember? Uh, they had uh, Saul, and he had fouled up. And Saul was head and shoulders above anybody else. And so Samuel, God the man now, but he was going to try to choose a king. So he went out to the sons of Jesse to choose a king, and all of the, the older boys were big boys like Saul, <clears throat> see? And, and the, the Lord said unto Samuel, 16, 7, look not on his countenance, his, look on, on the outside, you know, his muscles, look not on his countenance, neither on the height of his stature, because I've refused him. Mm -hmm. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looks on the outward appearance, mm -hmm. and the Lord looks on the heart. Now, there's some, Pastor, there's a good message for you. <laughs> you, you can take that I hear it. <laughs> and you can preach that, you see. Now, what's one of the biggest things that we do in looking on the outward appearance, men? I'm talking to men now. What, what's one of the things we do in our life? We go by the outward appearance. We make judgment. We judge people on their appearance. We judge people on their appearance. That's right. What kind of people? Now, you, men, men. I'm talking to men. Women. <laughs> Women. 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 That's exactly right. So oftentimes in choosing a wife, we go by outward appearance. Now, it doesn't hurt if she's pretty. <laughs> but we go by outward appearance. So Samuel lifted up his eyes. What was another mistake perhaps he made even before that one? We're going to school now, this is class. Lot chose selfishly. Lot chose selfishly. Right. Lot chose in his own interest, selfishly. That's right. What should he have done? I think he should have given Abraham the better. Right. Abraham was his daddy, uh, his foster father. He should have said, my father, you've raised me. I'm a rich man today because of you. Far be it from me, sir, to make a decision. Please, you make the decision, sir. You see? But he had a chance, boy, and he made it. Lot lifted up his eyes, now was well watered everywhere, down towards, towards Sodom. A lot of water, uh, good crops. I was up at uh, the Panhandle and uh, uh, visiting my farmer friends up there. And there was corn right here 
and, and, and ten inches away was desert. Yeah, desert, see. But right here was going, what was the difference? Water, irrigation, you see. Well watered everywhere. And so first he, he looked towards Sodom, then he went towards Sodom, then he was in Sodom, and, and then he was mayor of Sodom. Some Bible scholars teach us that the keeper of the gate was mayor, and the mayor of Sodom. And he was up there enjoying, enjoying those, 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 those riches. I, I'm, we're talking now about how to end well. How to end well. See, Lot was a righteous man. We're Christians. How to end well. How to make the right decisions and how to follow through on the right decisions. We know the rest of the story. How the angels, God told the angels to go down and destroy the city. So he went down, the angels went down, a couple of men, and uh, knocked on the door and, and uh, Lot let them in. And he said, look, he said, get your, get, your, get your family out of here because God's going to destroy this city. So he went to the sons-in-law, the fellows that married his daughter, and said, hey, God's going to destroy the city. And they said, you know, here's the old man again. He's on that religious binge, you know, <laughs> you know. So they didn't pay any attention to him. They didn't pay any attention to him. And he come back, and there's some fellows outside the door. And they said, hey, bring these guys out. We'd like to have sex with them. Uh, and sailor talk would be, bring them out. We'd like to bend them on. And he said, look, fellas, don't, don't do that wicked thing like that. Don't do that wicked thing. He said, look, take my two virgin daughters. And so he was offered to give him his two virgin daughters, you see. And so the angels put their hands out and blinded the men. They couldn't find the door. And so Lot got out with his wife and his two daughters, and they were on their way out. And he said, don't look back. Another, another, another sermon. Don't look back. Once we made that commitment to Christ, once we committed our life to Jesus, see, don't look back. Don't look back. Oh, Paul the Apostle says, this one thing I do. <laughs> he was after it. He was after it. This is what enables fellas to end well, is not looking back, going forward with Jesus. Well, he, we know that Lot's wife looked back and turned to a pillar of salt. And by the way, they were studying this in Sunday school one day, and a little boy said, you know, I, I, that's nothing. And he said, my mother was going downtown, driving downtown, and, and she looked back and turned into a telephone pole. <laughs> <laughs> so, on his way, on his way, he saw the little city of Zor. The angel said, get toward the hills. And he saw this little city of Zor. And he said, look, please. He said, uh, I, I'm not a bush, bush man. I'm, I'm a city man. Can't I just, okay, okay, okay. So they gave in to him. And we know that there's another thing, you see. I work with fellows all the time in hell for many years. You, you, you meet so few fellas who will say, this is the way I'm going, see. I'm going to go this way, see. And have that determination to go that way, that way. I was sure thrilled when my, one of my little grandkids, uh, a few, a couple months back, he said, Daddy, he's 14 now, he, said, he asked his daddy, Daddy, how can I, how can I beat these other guys? He said, son, he said, you have to put more time on a grinder than they do. He said, well, I got this one guy that's back and forth, back and forth. But he said, you get out there and you put more time in training than he does, you'll beat him. Well, he found him, found him an 8% grade out back of his house. And they live in Edmond and out with a building, uh, in their building section there. And he found him an 8% grade, and he worked out on an 8% grade. And he worked out so he'd get about half percent, about halfway up that 8% grade, and then he would accelerate. 
you know. If you, when you're running, if you can maintain your speed on a grade that you had on the flatland, you're happy. But he, he, he ranged it so he could accelerate on the grade. Of course, the next time he run with a mate, there's about halfway up the grade, and he looked over at him, smiled, and that drove one off, see. You know, why? Because down here, and fellas, down here, see this, see this, right here, right here, he had determined in his mind, I'm going to, I'm going to excel. Now we're on the second P. So we find that they were up there and the girl said, well, we're the only people left in the whole world. Let's get Dad drunk and sleep with him so we can have, have a baby. So the older when they got him drunk and slept with him that night and had a baby. And uh, uh, the next night they got him drunk again and, and had another baby. But you see, don't be too hard on those girls because, see, they were raised in Sodom. See, they thought like the Sodomites did. That's where they were raised, you know. They weren't raised in church. They weren't raised in Stillwater. They weren't raised in Edmond, Oklahoma City, you see. They thought like the people around them unless they had been taught different. Making it for the long haul. The decisions is what helps us make it for the long haul. I've got some handouts here I'm going to give you. Uh, the, first, the first one Peter will give out now. They already have it, John. They already have them? Yeah, they already have the first one. They already have the first one, all right. Let, let's go and have some questions as we go along. I'm going to ask the second t table over here. Okay, if you will read the first, first, first part of that, stand up someone and, and, and with a booming voice, read, uh, uh, starting right at the top of the page, right here, Look, who stood up? I can't okay. see anybody standing up. Oh, there you yeah. are. <laughs> so my principles needed to make long range, range decisions. Yes. Keep going. Uh, lay out our life realizing there are seasons. A spring, preparation, training, tutoring, life's boot camp, school, apprenticeship, establishing patterns and habits that will set the direction of your life. Okay, Summer, now so, someone else stand up and read, read the next one. B, Thank you. Summer, major interest chosen, further development, cultivation. Okay, read August. Read, read uh, autumn. C, autumn, secure your holdings, harvest, life beginning to close in, preserve fruits of what has been accomplished. D, right. winter, stage of realizing the fruits of the life already lived, much enjoyment in helping others succeed. Okay, questions on that now. Men, uh, living the long haul, living the life right on to the end, is not just a mere spiritual thing of going and sitting in Sunday school while somebody else does the lesson and you sit there, you see. We have to do some thinking. Spring, summer, autumn, and winter is our life. Now, if you're not where you want to be today, then you have to get where you want to be. If you haven't started off well, then you have to start now, you see, to be where you want to be. Tomorrow we're going to show you, I'll show you, how I get into the Word and answer questions out of the Bible itself. But, I, but keep in mind, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Um, I think differently now than I did when I was 40 years old. I purposely think different, 
Mr. She. I think now, how can I get 40 year olds and 50 year olds and 30 years old uh, underway because I know that I don't have as much time in front of me as I have behind me, you see. But some of you fellows are in the spring of your life and early summer of your life. You have to make decisions accordingly. And you have to make actions accordingly to live, to be where you want to be out yonder. Questions? A bit louder. <laughs> uh, John, how do you determine what season you're in? I'll answer that one in just a minute. Uh, let's go to the next one because the answer is in the next in the next group. Of what season are you in? Okay, let's go to this table over here and read the next group. Number two, work towards balance in the following areas of development. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Luke 2.52. Okay. Wisdom. Intellect. Stature. Physical. God. Spiritual. Man. Social. What season are you in? Well, if you're 40 years old, you are not in the spring of your life in wisdom. You're not in the spring of your life in stature. But you're in the babyhood of your life spiritually. You see? You're not in the spring of your life socially. You might be married and have a couple of three kids. You see? But, but you might be a mature person uh, all around except spiritual. Many people come into our church that are quite mature and quite regular, might even be professors or bankers. If you are in the young part of your life physically, then that decision should be made. Physically, do you have an exercise program? What kind of exercise program should you have? Well, when you're young, you can have a, a, a very vigorous exercise program. I ran till I was 75 years old. Then the doctor says, it might be just as well if you walked. <laughs> Now then, the heavy part of my exercise program is walking. I try to get two miles a day. I haven't measured all. And right now, because of the four-way bypass and the uh, angiogram uh, stents have been put in, uh, uh, Peter or my wife or someone goes with me. Uh, by the way, I'm going in Tuesday for some more clotted uh, uh, artery, you see, and so on. You make those decisions accordingly. Sometimes a fellow show up at, uh, at, at church and he's got a bring leg. He's 30 years old, you know, 28 years old, and he's kind of shy. And, and we say, hey, what, what happened, Joe? <laughs> you know. Well, what happened was he was playing football with the 19-year-old. <laughs> 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 and uh, you, know, you don't do that. <laughs> Questions? You want to keep this now? Good stuff. How to make, how to last out yonder, okay? If you think of a question, we'll go back. We can go back, okay? What, what, what's the next, we'll start here. Oh, you take the next group. Use the above in four areas of your life. A, work, our life's career, 
B, finances, income, debt, planning, budgeting, saving, giving. C, marriage, building a lifelong relationship with one person, dating, engagement, marriage. D, ministry, your part in furthering God's kingdom, evangelism, follow-up, discipling, training, and equipping. Becoming a disciple of Christ and then reproducing yourself in the life of another. All right, read the first, first one again. Uh, work, our life's career. Our life's career. Okay. <clears throat> we need to. Uh, there's a lot of work, a lot, a lot, lot of work that can, uh, a lot of work that needs to be done in that in, in work. <laughs> but you maybe get 40 years old and you need to, you want to change. See, we get some proper help. Uh, in helping young fellows, we don't get into that tomorrow, in helping young fellows, you want to help them lay the foundation properly. Uh, John's boy is good at math. Well, my boy was good at math. And I had an idea what he would be perfect at. But I didn't say anything. So he chose geology. So he went to college and got a degree in geology. And we were overseas. And then we came back home. And, uh, and so he worked in the oil patch during the early 80s, you know, when it was on the boom. And it helped pay a big hunk of his college. And so he thought, this is perfect. When I get out of college, I'll just tie right in with one of these companies. And you know, well, at 83, he got out. And lo and behold, uh, the bus. You remember that? Well, he wanted to get married. And so he, he was at the house. And Dad, all I can get is $4.50. Here I am with college education, you know, and so on, so on, so on, so on. I said, well, son, if you want just a job job, I can get you a job job for $6 as a laborer. He says, well, that's more than four fifty. I said, well, I believe it is, and I didn't graduate. <laughs> so he got a job as a laborer for concrete. And then he decided, well, maybe I better be a builder. And so uh, he went back to night school and picked up estimating uh, transit. And, uh, and he was with a construction company. And the boss liked him. And he said, look, if you want to stay with us, I'll start you training for a superintendent. So he started training him under one of the old men for superintendent. Then the company split, and they, they, they friendly split, and they let, let him go where they wanted to, and he decided to go in the office. Well, he's a project manager now. Well, that's what I had in mind way back yonder, but I didn't say so. <laughs> this is the reason why I guided him into math, because with math, you've got so many basic things for, as a foundation. So in helping young people, help them and, and, and don't let them uh, get into basket weaving or square dancing or something. You can't, you can't make a living at it. You see? You know? but, but you help them with, with their work. Questions or comments? Or? John, I got one. I have one. Yes. How do you... How does one motivate oneself to make these changes and, and to, pull? are there any, I know, I, I, want, I want to ask for a formula, but sometimes it's real hard. Uh, you know that you need changes in your life, uh, and God's dealing with you that you need to make changes, and there's things that He wants to do with you and through you, but you don't really know exactly how to start. You don't really know exactly how to get yourself to that point to where you can step out 
and, and pursue that. How, how do you, once you know what the thing that you're trying to accomplish, how do you motivate yourself and how do you get started and what's the first steps? Yes. Uh, how to get started in the first steps, but you know where you want to go? Is that right? Well, you know the direction you want to go. Yeah, how to get started, okay. Bible said, Bible says, in the multitude of counselors there is safety. Bible says, by wise counsel thou shalt make thy war. Uh, uh, do, you, do you want to tell us what it is or, or you'd rather not? Well, I, I just, I'm like every ma other man in here, I think. I, I feel like that, I just, I just want to do what God, I, I feel like I know I have a purpose, but I don't know the specific of that purpose. Okay, very good. But I do want, I want to obey, right. but I don't know how to start. I don't right. really know where to begin. Very good. Uh, I had, it was the same way. And of course, when I was saved back in 1940, if you really want to sell out, if you really mean business, be a preacher. And I thought, oh no, you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, I said, well, okay, you know, that's it, you know, you know that's it. Well, that's no way to be in the ministry where you're head down and shame, you see. Because I didn't think, you know, I just, see. But that is not true. If you really want that out, what you do for a living, as long as it's honest, is all right. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance when ye serve the Lord Christ. What you do for a living is quite all right. Uh, Colonel Axe up here just got out of the military 24 years, you see. But he's been making disciples and sharing his faith for 18 years now, 19 years now, uh, you see. Uh, my, my son is in, in construction. I just listened to his, to his workshop. Uh, uh, tremendous workshop. Uh, I'm working with guys in their 50s and 60s and one in his 70s, uh, you know, a retired professor. Uh, what he does, he don't do anything now except live off investments, but, but he's, 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 he and his pastor are busy in the ministry, busy in the ministry, see. So what you do for a living is a uh, it's what you want to do, what you want to do, and what you can do. Now then, the other question is, how can I serve the Lord? We won't get into that tomorrow. One of the ways you serve the Lord is, I'll tell you my story. My ship pulled up to San Francisco, and Doss Trotman, we had a big center, uh, you know, upstairs where all of the sailors would come, uh, Christian fellas. And uh, I was just coming up the stairway. The sailor calls it a ladder. I was coming up the ladder, he was coming down the ladder. And he said, Johnny, I was hoping I could see you. You got a minute? Yeah, sure. All I had was time, of course. So this was in downtown Oakland, and we went out in the, in the, in the park there, in the grass. And uh, he said, Johnny, what you got on your heart, you know? And what's the Lord been teaching you these days? Well, in navigator circles in those days, that was a code word. So what you did is you took out your verse pack and you gave him the last three verses that you memorized. <laughs> see, that was a code word. What's the Lord been teaching you these days? Well, this is what he's been teaching you, see? <laughs> so we visited. Then he said, uh, what uh, what you got on your heart after the conflict? And I mentioned about going back to Alabama and going to school and tying in with the Baptist. And he thought that'd be a good idea. And uh, then I mentioned about youth work. And he said, you know what, John? If you disciple one man, 
He could be a pastor, you could be a youth worker, be two places at one time. See? Then we talked about missionary work. And I said, Gosh, what I really would like to be as a missionary. He said, You know, John, if you disciple two guys, one could be a pastor, one could be a youth worker, and you could be a missionary. You'd be three places at one time. Then he rolled over on his on his elbow like this, and just like he thought of it for the first time, which he had the first, he said, you know what, Johnny? If you never figure out just what you ought to do, you can just spend your whole life raising up disciples and sending them all over the world. Now, you see, if we're talking about man-to-man -man disciples, we're not talking about recruiting three bright young men to go to seminary. That's another job. We're going to do that too, by the way. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about every person. Now, in this room, I, I hope that there are not but very few fellows that aren't fathers or don't have the potential to be fathers. And if they are in this room and they can't have children, in all probability they'll want to adopt one. Fair enough? So, man to man, what God has for you, I'll give you, I'll give you the leading. Just come back, I give you the lead. He wants you to help fellows become disciples. Paul says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the graces in Christ Jesus. Second Timothy 2, verse 1. The second verse, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Faithful men. Doesn't say brilliant men. Doesn't say overly dedicated men. Doesn't say overly talented men. It says faithful men. And this is what we want to do in this church. Is find a few faithful men. You know, if you go to work at 8 o'clock and you're never late, you'd call that faithful, right? Mm -hmm. Call that faithful. I have a part-time secretary. She, if she's going to be five minutes late, she she phones. She's faithful, you know. I don't expect her to be that, you know. Only God, she, you know, whatever she wants. You see, a faithful man who shall teach <coughs> others also. And he goes on to say, Thou therefore in your hardness. As a, uh, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangle himself with affairs of this life, and it may please him who has chosen him to be a soldier. Verse 5 says, And if a man strive for mastery, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. Had some time with Jim Ryan. You know what Jim Ryan is? Yes. <laughs> Jim Ryan is the first high schooler that ever broke the four minute mile. Jim Ryan is a, is a senator in uh, Washington, D.C. for the state of Kansas. And uh, he went to the Olympics four times. Well, he was geared up for the fifth time. And he was running in the tryout and he said, I don't know if I stumbled or if he tripped me. Naturally, I think he tripped me. And I asked the authorities for another try, and they said, no, just, uh, Jim, just keep working out and come back ne next time. Well, that was, he'd already been 44, 16 years, you see, you know. And the man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strives Lawfully. Now, in building men, 
See, it's got to be done right. That's the reason we, we, we put in these practical things here. It's, you know, Peter, give him another handout. Laboring over a lifetime? Yeah. The reason I have so many handout is I want you to want you to know that I did my homework. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you think of something, write it down and we'll go over it tomorrow. We're working on one subject, how to last for the long haul, or how to be productive for the long haul. Uh, I'll tell you a couple of stories. I had a buddy by the name of Don. We we'll call him Don. You know why I like to call him Don? What's that? Because that's his name. <laughs> we were working with Doss, and Don was a brilliant man. I mean, he was a brilliant man. Uh, he helped me a lot, and he was chief petty officer. And Doss asked him one day, he said, Don, about how many verses do you think? Oh, I don't know. Maybe 2,500. Doss said, Don, I wish you only knew 500 and they knew you. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we're talking about. Uh, by the way, it isn't how many verses you know, it's how many verses know you. John 14, 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. We sang a song a while ago, didn't we? We sang a song that I may know him. Didn't we sing that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see? Well, fellas, I, I, I'm going to be funny here, I hope. <laughs> we can stand here and plead all night that I may know him. But John 14, 21, says, I'll tell you how, how, to, how you get to know him. He that has my commandments and keeps them. Obey the Bible. Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, love your neighbors, you love yourself. The Bible says, love your wife like Christ loved the church. You see? And so on, you know? Obey the Bible and God will reveal himself to us. According to the scripture, 1421. Okay, let's start reading there. Uh, so, so, let's back, go back to front this time. Let's start over here. On this, the lifetime? Yes. Laboring over a lifetime. What causes some laborers to fade in their vision and fervency and stop laboring? There could be a number of things. However, I thought of three in my own experience when working with people over the years. A. They get into sin. Of course, sin nullifies the effectiveness of the labor. 1 John 3.21, Beloved, if my heart condemns me, if my heart condemns us not, then we have confidence towards God. Romans 14.22, Happy is the man that condemneth not himself in the thing which he allowed. Simply, it's letting sin and the other things of this world crowd and rub us out of our effectiveness. B. B, there's a poor foundation. Many people labor on the strength of their own salvation experience. They're young and they go along with the crowd. Persuaded by the group, they never have their own foundation deep in God's Word. Naturally, as Jesus' illustration of the parable of the house that lasts, when the foundation isn't strong, the house won't last in the storms of life. And C, people just wander off. We, like sheep, have all gone astray. We also, like sheep, continue to go astray. Many people avoid or neglect or to put themselves under the discipline of another person as they move from place to place, and thus they do not have accountability. Accountability is one of the major factors that keeps us from walking off like sheep. Yep. I don't have anybody above me now, <laughs> you know, but I appoint people, naturally they're younger than I am, 
I appoint people to whom I'm responsible. Uh, in the older days, I think the Methodist Church had a good deal. It might have got too far, but anyway, it was started off right where they had the bishops and the elders and so on and so on. And each guy was responsible for some guys. You see. Well, we don't do that too much in the Baptist Church, but we need to take responsibility ourselves mm -hmm. and appoint people. That's right. I get together each week with fellas and quote my verses. I quote my verses each week. I quote my, my verses that I that I'm current verses, these are my current verses, and then I have some back review verses that I quote. You see? I, I make myself responsible to two or three fellows. And this is one of, the, one of the greatest ways. You know this old business of, well, a young person, 19, 20, 21, you know, I, I just want my freedom. I just want to get out of this house, you know. I want to get my own apartment, you know, and so on. You see, that's bad maintenance, bad maintenance. I know they got to get out of the house, and I know they got to get their own apartment, so on and so forth. Watch that attitude and try to help young people. Try to help them because uh, having someone to watch for you and check on you and pray for you, and that's what the church is for with the elders and with the deacons. Go ahead and read some more. Helping you continue laboring over the years, the long haul. Put yourself under accountability wherever you go. It doesn't need to be a pastor or a deacon or a fellow navigator. The major thing that will keep you from going into sin simply because your brother will correct you. Depend upon God's Word. Those disciplines of memorizing and review, reading the Bible and studying the Bible will put you in good stead over the years. The Holy Spirit using the Word will keep you. This will affect your walk as the Holy Spirit works in and through your mind and your heart. In summary, it's the Holy Spirit of God using His Word under the discipline and accountability of another brother that will keep you in the harvest field. Question? That last statement, you might want to memorize that. Yeah. Well, we'll, uh, we'll pick up tomorrow and uh, go, go some more. If you think of some questions, uh, during the night, jot them down and we'll talk about them tomorrow, okay? Okay, let's pray. We've we got a question over here, yes? Uh, why do you think people uh, don't have a love for God's Word? Why do you think people just go to church and don't do anything about it the rest of the week? Well, it could be several things. They could not be saved, of course, you know. Uh, and I do not, I do not know Jesus at all. Uh, I, I think I think that was me for a while. You know, I, just, I just went because uh, things to do, and my mother wanted me to go, and I, I love my mother, and so on. Uh, we're going to go into this tomorrow, but sometimes we don't understand. We've never been taught how important. The Bible is, you see. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Joshua 1 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. We haven't been taught that. You know, we haven't been taught that. Uh, uh, Proverbs uh, 2, 1, 4, and 5. Uh, my son, keep my words and live my commandments with thee. 4 and 5. Bind them upon thy finger and write them upon the table of thine heart. You see? Uh, we haven't been taught that. So, one, that's one of, the, one of the reasons. We haven't been taught that the uh, revelation and his name is called the Word of God, speaking of Jesus, you see. Uh, 
Uh, one, Psalm 119, 155. Salvation, listen, salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. This is the statute, see? This is the word, the statutes, the precepts, several, several words that cover this, you see? Salvation is far from the wicked, for they seek not thy statutes. And this is what keeps it from sin. Now, it's more than knowing it. It's more than knowing it. I, I worked for an evangelist several years ago. I was teaching counselor training classes. And he preached a message one night, Job 4, 8. Even as I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. And I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit just convicted. And there's several thousand people, four or five thousand people at the meeting. And a good 35, 40 people came forward. And we just had a tremendous harvest. My own heart was, was convicted. And um, I memorized that verse, Job 4 8. I was sure heartbroken. A few years later, when I learned that this evangelist was divorcing his wife, mm -hmm. see? Yeah. Well, you have to know it. Do more than know it. You have to put it into practice. That's the reason why we need pastors and elders and, and accountability. Yes, sir. So, sometimes in the workplace, you know, we're all supposed to be an example to be Christ-like and, you know, we're supposed to do our jobs and perform as if we were doing it for the Lord's sake and to Jesus. Yeah. But sometimes it's really difficult because we don't always agree with everything that goes on in the workplace and it's real easy to get caught up in that negative thinking and that, that negative point of view. And if, if you become, if you're not the example that you should be in the workplace, is it ever too late to turn things around and and to change that and to make to make a difference in your workplace even though you really don't seem set apart. I mean no one really they don't really see that you're much different than anybody else in the workplace. Yeah. Well uh, uh First thing is, we need to analyze ourselves and we need to get some help ourselves and to be sure that we're in the Word, that we're praying, that we have a quiet time uh, in the workplace. I'll go back to my son's workshop. We did a workshop on victory in the, walking in victory in the workplace. That was his workshop. Well, he was at, uh, he was in Cleveland, Ohio, and the boss handed him a contract, and it, it, there were some shady things in it. So he looked it over and took back to the boss and said, I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I can't do it. And I, I was the only way out. It cost him his job, you see. And more recently, he had another job, and he was in uh, uh, Del Rio, Texas. And they were having a, having a, uh, community meeting or something. He was building a courthouse down there. And, you know, the community meeting or whatever they do, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, this, there was ladies present, and this uh, marshal, very big old marshal, with his six guns, was giving the speech, and he was filthy, filled with bulb and talk. And my son got up and said, sir, he said, I, I really don't have to listen to that kind of talk, and walked out. So there goes the general contract. What thrilled me is that his son, his 17-year-old, knew that, and he's very good in drama. He goes to Edmund High. And so in the play, it had some bad words. So he went to the professor and said, sir, I'm terribly sorry, but I can't, I can't say those. They changed the script, you see? Okay. But he'd seen Daddy do it, so he did it. He's good up. So, but we, we may need some, some help ourselves. Uh, I was saved a few months before I went aboard ship. 
on the board ship for four years. I was the only Christian aboard ship. And uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. But, we, but if we get some help, it will help us to live the life. And one guy I work with, work for, I'm going to give him the credit to be the weakest man that I've ever had the privilege of working with. And uh, he gave me a bad time all the time. All the time. Well, we were in battle in Guadalcanal, and we were trying to get a liberty ship off the rocks. And the sonar men passed the word that we were being stalked. A Japanese submarine was stalking us, you see, you know. Well, I was up on number one line with this guy, and there was a range fall, dark, about 11.30 at night, and there's a little bit of a lull in the storm, and he leaned over and he said, you know, Crawford, he said, I've got to admit that what you've got is the real thing, okay? So that thrilled me, that really thrilled me, and I've had uh, old chiefs tell me that uh, what you've got is a real thing. But it takes takes years living the life before. But we may need some help personally, but we may be doing some things that uh, that we shouldn't be doing. And we might be doing, need to do some things that we should be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Questions? Is it, is it ever too late to start though? It's never too late to start. That's right. We are where we are right now. Our age, sickness, or what have you. We are where we are right now. That's a deep thought. You know? Pete, pray for us and we'll quit for the night.